So the word of the day is innovation today. I think we've said it at least 10,000 times. And I think in the coming 10 minutes, I'll say it at least 1,000 times. <laughs> but this morning, I didn't coordinate anything with the so panel, nor with the, uh, Joanna, who spoke about, social, uh, about innovation and social innovation and the importance of innovation. We have always seen or thought about social innovators as being these big heroes, that superman kind who's gonna, and we see that a lot in the media. We see that a lot in academia. We see that a lot like big case studies on big organizations that are innovating and changing and being big. Uh, but we never th look at innovation from the perspective of what it is, which is uh, something new to the market or something new to the organization or a small step or a small advance. So I would like just to remind that when we talk about innovation, we're not always talking about the social entrepreneurs that will uh, have a new revolution. These, ex these persons exist, but also it's mostly about the idea of introducing a new product, a new process, a new idea, or advance it in a sustainable way. So that's, yeah, we la I would like to break this myth of innovation being something uh, it is important, but it's something that you have to do, otherwise you will not survive. It's not the mission of every organization to innovate constantly. You have to innovate when, when it comes to the time to innovate, but you don't have to push your innovation. And when we look at social entrepreneurs, so also on a, in terms of the context, we see that we have a lot of uh, the, from a political and public perspective, innovation is becoming something very important. Everyone's talking about it a lot. Uh, if you take the definition of the Europe 2020 strategy, uh, they put innovation at, at the heart of this strategy. So research and innovation, sustainable, uh, thanks to, uh, in this case, they the way they define it. It's all about introducing uh, innovation uh, that are not only good for society, but also enhance individual capacity to act. So innovation is at the heart of the European uh, vision of uh, advancing societies. And I think Robin uh, this morning uh, spoke about the Chinese perspective in which the government is pushing towards social entrepreneurship and also innovating uh, and the social innovations. So even in, from a Chinese perspective, not only a European one, we see that this is becoming very important. So just for those who didn't come this morning, I will give some stats about the innovation in our survey. And from the 1,000 plus social entrepreneurship that we surveyed, and I would like to highlight uh, the gender balance. We have almost 50% male, 50% female who participated in it. We get, we see that. So, so yeah. Just a second. I will. I wanted to. We asked the social entrepreneurs a couple of questions on innovation. So we wanted to distinguish between the product innovation, the process innovation, and the services. So it's not just innovation as a whole, but we wanted to understand it a little bit further. Also, we wanted to know how important was this innovation to the social enterprise, the impact of this innovation in terms of it's how much did it cost, the social impact it had, uh, how new it is, and who collaborated to this innovation. So it's not just about did you innovate or not, but how and why, and who was part of this innovation. If I take the case of one of the organizations we interviewed in Belgium, uh, Velo, what they do, it's a work integration social enterprise who's uh, constantly uh, training newcomers to Belgium, but also people who are in jail uh, and coming out of jail, so to, to integrate the workplace, but at the same time uh, by uh, uh, providing a service to the city of Leuven, which is bikes. So they have big, uh, big companies supporting them, big organizations, the University of Leuven, who are renting and using the bikes that Velo provides. But at the same time, we, they constantly look for new niches, new markets, new people, new ways to, 
to scale because for them there is so much demand that from the work integration perspective but also to stay sustainable and to be able to have to pay at the end well the big amount uh, that they have in terms of uh, new employees and trainings and stuff that they need to constantly uh, innovate and when we talked to them they were always saying that we introduced a new product which is uh, we introduced a new service we introduced and they are constantly running after new innovations new things to survive so so you have these organizations that are innovating as a survival mode and not just because they have this new idea that will have a positive social impact and these types of innovations are important also to to keep in mind because you don't always innovate and we we like to think that we innovate because we want to change things but sometimes we innovate because we want to survive and to find new sources of financing so um, one of the most interesting statistics and we saw it a little bit with Uta this morning is that the when we ask social entrepreneurs if they innovated we saw that between 67 and 97 percent of entrepreneurs we interviewed said that they innovated if we compare this number to for instance in Europe to commercial entrepreneurs usually it's like for 50 percent who innovate so we see we're saying we're seeing that social entrepreneurs believe that they are much more innovative than commercial entrepreneurs and this is an interesting question why do what's so new, what's so innovative about the way they, uh, they innovate and why, why are they m more innovative? And I think that in the discussion, this is what I would like to hear a bit is that how come social entrepreneurs think of themselves as being so innovative and uh, much, well, almost one third more than commercial, their commercial uh, counterparts. Um, Another also uh, interesting statistic is when we get to the percentage among those social entrepreneurs that had introduced an innovation in the past year, those who had a radical innovation, so completely a new product, a new service to the market. And we see also a very high number of in, uh, social entrepreneurs who say that they, for, of those who innovated, that they had some kind of uh, radical innovation and these place between 50% up to 82% for Portugal, which is also very high compared to other uh, two commercial uh, entrepreneurs. So what is so special about social entrepreneurs that they bring all this new, uh, new uh, innovations in terms of product services or, or processes in terms of uh, innovation? So uh, sometimes you have, yeah, it's easy to see radical innovations as we, if we look at uh, an organization in the UK, such as uh, Warner Again, who will take, uh, who wants to errad eradicate textile waste. So they are investing a lot in research and development to use this waste into new products. So yeah, we can see that. But this is not every social entrepreneur who does such radical innovations. So how come social entrepreneurs see themselves uh, as innovators and why do they do so much, so much innovation? This is, these are some of the questions that I would like to highlight today. And most importantly, because this is the theme of the, uh, the conference today is the idea of challenges. What are the challenges that social entrepreneurs face? And uh, we see that 44% of social entrepreneurs replied that it's related to economics, so the financing. And 17% say that it's organizational, so it's that time. We don't have the human capital. We don't have the organizational capital in place to be able to innovate properly or these are challenges in terms of uh, innovation. Then we see that some of them, uh, uh, another type of uh, challenge is the market. So uh, we don't know about the demand or we have the market is dominated by big players who are traditional uh, uh, ent uh, commercial entrepreneurs or the public sector. So we see that it's not easy to enter this market. And, 8%, and uh, also you have 16% who say that it's in terms of 
regulations that we have to follow, legal forms uh, to meet the international regulations such as the EU and, and other th among other things. So these are some quotes that highlight what I just said in terms of quantitative statistics, but also we hear it in the discourse of the social entrepreneurs that we met and we talked to and we spoke to, and we see it also, it's, you have to t take it in context. If I take, for instance, the last one, uh, from a European perspective, you see that the legal is not always playing in favor of social entrepreneurs. Uh, so we have a social entrepreneur in Belgium who said something that makes that makes it hard for us at the moment is the European legislation about subsidies that are admitted from Europe uh, to companies. So the called the minimis norm, which limits uh, to to $100,000 for five years. So this is a challenge in terms of regulations and uh, that were imposed by the European Union. On the other hand, if we take the Chinese counterpart, so the last quote, we see that uh, one of the Chinese uh, social entrepreneurs we interviewed said that, I don't think there are any specific negative influences. There are many good uh, policies. During recent years, policy towards social organization have been uh, quite encouraging. And if you recall what uh, Robin said this morning, I felt that uh, we didn't interview him, and it wasn't his quote, but it was almost a copy of what he said. So we can see that oh, in, in other contexts, and this is my next point, is that context is important. So innovation is also depends a lot on in the, of the context in which you are. If I take two examples, the UK and China, we see that from a UK perspective, the biggest challenge is related to finance. While in China, the biggest challenge uh, uh, is uh, related to market. So getting your product to entering this market. And I think Robin today, when he spoke on the panel, he was quite eloquent in, in uh, saying it when he said about the challenges of uh, the companies uh, accepting his products at the beginning and the way. So I think it goes hand in hand w with what we see uh, from the statistics. My final point, and this is my, uh, an example that I like to cite, is Via Via Cafe in Belgium, in which we see that we usually, when we think about innovation, we always think that we have to wait to have a perfect product and then to launch it to the market. And, to, and we cannot, to, uh, but from Via Via, what we learn is that instead of waiting always for the perfect product, perfect model, and then replicate it, well, Via Via, what they does is to experiment. So every year they opened a new cafe, so which is a social. So Via Via is a social enterprise in Belgium that started in Belgium, and they do tons of activities and tons of. Uh, so they use local products. They have dorms that train the employees. They give they give shares uh, to their employees in the hotels they open. They they have a sustainable tra uh, travel agency. They have. They do lots of organic and local farming and so on. And what you see with Via Via is that every year since 1995, they opened a new Via Via. So the first one was in, was in Belgium. The second one was in Indonesia. Then they went to Senegal. Then went, they went back to Belgium and so on for 20 years. And out of the 20 Via Via that opened, 16 are still running today and doing well. So. And when we speak, and we spoke uh, quite a lot with the founding, uh, the person who founded Via Via, he told us, well, his secret is two things. One, to experiment, and two, to adapt to the local context. So he doesn't impose his Via Via model to any of the countries. Instead, he, he looks at what they want, what they are looking for, what are the needs of the local communities, and then the Via Via uh, is... Uh, is done well is adapted to this local market so these are i think this goes a bit also hand in hand with what joanna was saying this morning and in, in terms of experiment experimentation where innovation also is experimentation and innovation is not uh, an objective in itself but it's a means to get to a sustainable development and uh, having a social impact 
So this is a bit what I wanted to say today. And I think I will invite now Inti uh, to have his reflections. And as you could see, I didn't stress much on the technological and the technological part since uh, in innovation we talk a lot about technology and what technology can bring because I think Indy is much has the experience and it's his focus so I will leave it to him. Hi everyone and thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we have innovated as a business and how we started and what we're now currently doing. So it's important to say to start off with our innovation has happened because it's had to have happened for us to survive. And also it's happened, some of it's actually happened by chance. So some of the reasons why we started, we're an online magazine, um, British Asian lifestyle, so quite niche in what we do. And when we initially started to have a look online at the other organizations, other businesses, uh, other establishments that were in our space, there was very little content around British Asian lifestyle that we could find online in particular. Um, so we knew straight away there was a quite a, a niche segmentation of the market that we could take from that. We also um, knew that there was a lot of um, British Asians in particular that my background is, is media and fashion that wanted to get into digital media, online journalism, video and photography. And for a number of reasons, we weren't seeing a lot of um, British Asian faces on TV or online or even um, in the digital space. So we wanted to be a channel to help develop talent and to nurture them and then also to let them go to other organisations that were looking for people, i.e. BBC, ITV, radio, etc., etc. Um, we also had to do uh, initially a lot of um, changing of mindset. So when we started to have a look at the content, we started to put together on, an online magazine um, we noticed that a lot of PR agencies that were particularly focusing on British Asian lifestyle content in particular were sending out lots of press releases and other online magazines were just taking those and copying and pasting them, putting them straight out. What they weren't actually doing was monetizing that, so they weren't actually looking at how they could innovate and how they could actually draw some funds from, from those PR agencies. Um, so what we decided to do was, was quite radical because we thought, actually, we're not going to do that. We're just going to carry on doing and focusing on content that we know is missing. And a lot of that was around taboo, around um, taboo things within the Asian community. So things like uh, sex before marriage or domestic violence within the Asian community and lots of those kind of hard hitting issues. We also done all the light stuff like the fashion, the food, the health and beauty, arts and culture. Um, so as we started to do that, PR agencies started to notice us. And actually, these guys, we've sent them a press release and they haven't put it out. So they send it to us again, and we, again, we wouldn't put it out. And then they, we'd start getting phone calls saying, listen, we've sent you three or four press releases. Everyone else is putting them out. You guys ain't doing it. What, what's going on here? And we were like, well, yeah, that's because you haven't paid us for that press release. <laughs> and they were a bit taken back by that because they're like, well, actually, you, you guys, are, no one else is doing that. And you're, you're kind of a new, you know, new into the market. Anyway, that continued for about six or seven years before they actually started to now pay us for those press releases because what we did we actually changed that whole mindset of that of that online community especially within the british asian um, forte itself to say actually you can you can actually start getting paid for this content and i think that's what's really held a lot of those online niche magazines back um, so we were innovative in that way to actually bring that to the force and say actually we're not going to do that we're going we're to change some mindsets here um Another thing that we we actually happened by chance, a bit of innovation, yeah, over the years, because a lot of those people that were reading us wanted to get into digital media, they wanted to get into video, online journalism, video photography, we've always had CVs sent to us. So again, our, our social aspect of our business is, is training people into digital media, into journalism, into video, into photography, and then sending them off into organizations where they can actually grow and, and who need them. And then because we've always had CVs coming through to us, we've always thought, actually, and that's continued now, even into admin and finance and, and credit control and, and PR, etc. What we've done is we've thought, actually, instead of us forwarding on these, these, this talent, these talented people who've come from some big organizations to us and saying, actually, you guys have them. That's what we've always done is signposted them. Well, why don't we now open up our own jobs board online, which promotes diversity and inclusion? So we have around 300,000 visitors every month reading our online magazine. They're mainly BME 18 to 34 year olds and they're sending us their CV. So if we create an online job sport on the magazine itself, we can again monetize what we're doing through the job sport by 
placing advertisements for organizations who are looking for people, but then also add value back to those guys that we can't facilitate and we can't take on within our own business. So, so we've done that recently. We had organizations like the police now advertise with us. We've got the MOD, we've got the BBC, etc. These guys that we used to feed people too and and I think some of that innovation was obviously that happened by chance we weren't we didn't set off to start an, a, a, a job sport it was more around content um, and also again within the structure of our business we we you know first and foremost we are a business the social aspect of what we do is is a byproduct of what we do you know we started off by saying actually we're a business how are we going to monetize this we also opened up Aiden Digital, which became the social enterprise because we knew we were training up people. We knew that they were benefiting from the training we were getting and they're going to other organizations. So we, actually, we're already doing the social stuff. We started off by saying, what's the need? How are we going to cater for that need? And now we're actually a social business because we're already doing this. So it wasn't just to become a social enterprise. It was actually, we're already a social enterprise by the work that we do. Um, so now we're at a stage where we're, you know, we're, we're we're still innovating, we're still growing, we're, we're still trying to monetize in lots of different aspects and lots of other ideas in, in, in the back of our minds for us to enable us to do that. And, and I guess to say, it's, it's just to round it all off, is innovation happens for us by chance. Not all of it is pre-planned and it's also happened because we've had to innovate in order for us to survive and compete with others in, in the market. That's it, thank you. So um, we've got... Uh Couple of minutes for question and answers. So, uh, any questions from from the room? Yeah, I've just got one question. We heard a lot about innovation and um, complicated things like that. Um, now, I just wonder what um, aspect creativity has in terms of innovation, because in a conventional organisation, you're bound by lots of rules and regulations about what you can and what you can't do. Whereas in a social enterprise, is that a bit more freer environment? Hello. Yeah, so I guess it is, it is for, for us, we've never really focused on, I know we had a conversation on the table about boards, um, and we've never said, actually, we've got an official board. So, we, you know, for us, it's never been about constraints around what we can or can't do. We look at ourselves as, as a normal business, as a business that any other business is. It just so happens that we have a social aspect to what we do. So I guess it's never held us back as a business to just, just because we're, we're, we're a CIC social enterprise. So I don't think there really are any constraints that we, we would focus on, if that answers your question. Any, any other questions? Over there, yeah. Yeah, um, there, I feel a slight disconnect uh, with where we started with Joanna, really with innovation being so difficult to do and Later on this afternoon, we, we find that, that so many of the social enterprises are not just innovative, but radically innovative. Um, and obviously, you know, um, the, the examples we've seen here are really very impressive and, and clearly very innovative. But I'm, I'm just raising some questions about it, it's a self reporting methodology, I guess, and whether the, there might be some institutional factors that might lead to an over reporting of particularly the radical element of innovation which seems also very high thank you apparently I'm taking that question <laughs> so I think um, there's two answers to that the first is that what we use basically is the methodology that's been developed for the community innovation surveys for the European Commission they're based on the Oslo manual so these questions have been extensively tested in all sorts of contexts they're regularly used throughout the European Union and so we chose them deliberately to make sure that we have a comparison standard so if the comparison inflated even if the comparison is inflated it's still valid I think that the social enterprises uh, innovate more or think uh, well they, they may think of themselves as more innovative but the way the questions are phrased it really is about actually introducing and changing existing products processes and services so it's very 
uh, behavioral bound, and so you would expect less of an inflation in there. And then when they report on whether it's radical, it's not that we are asking them, do you think this is a radical innovation or a great innovation? I'm sure they would say yes to that. Um, it would be pity if they weren't. But we're actually asking them, is this new to your organization, and is it also new to the market you're operating in? So it's, again, a bit more descriptive. So I cannot exclude that there might be some in inflation, but I do have faith in the questions because they've been largely pre-tested, and also because the way they ask is very very specific about behavior, which tends to be less susceptible to these self-report biases. <laughs> I think another thing is that Johanna is talking about the link between innovation and scaling and how you can't, how you can't have one without the other. So I think that what's really difficult is not just introducing the new products, but actually scaling them or diffusing them. Um, so I think that it's the entire process as a whole that's very diffi difficult. Um, and I think that that also explains part of the discrepancy. Yes, another question over there. Last question. Last question. Just want to um, pick up on um, your point just on the Oslo manual. There seems a bit of a um, mismatch with the defining um, innovation with the um, Oslo manual as, a as it compared to the um, Horizon 2020. The Oslo manual very much um, kind of more commercial, kind of market dominated. Yeah, so we are not saying that we're measuring social innovation, we're measuring innovation in social enterprises, some of which is social, some of which is maybe, uh, well, I'm not going to say just improving processes or existing products or services, but these still apply to social enterprises because they're trading in the marketplace, they offer services, they offer products, and so improving those and, and offering new services or products or maybe becoming better in terms of business processes is still essential to social enterprises. So. We're looking at innovation and part of it is social innovation. Does that make sense?